Five years ago, I met a young woman who had just been diagnosed with stomach cancer, a terrible diagnosis. Along with her other doctors, I knew that if we took the usual approach for her, we would get the usual outcome, and she'd probably die within a year. None of us wanted that. None of us wanted the usual outcome, so we decided to take an unusual approach. We mapped her genes. I know, that's what you're all thinking, right? <laughs> Our hope was that we would find some abnormality that would guide us to select a treatment that we otherwise would not have thought about. And when we did it, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We found a gene that we would not have expected, and even better, there was a drug being developed by a major pharmaceutical company that would target that exact gene. I remember contacting the company and asking them if we could use that drug for this patient. They said, sure, absolutely. You just have to have permission from the United States Food and Drug Administration. So six months and tons of paperwork later, I received approval from the US FDA to give this patient the silver bullet. I called Toma to let her know that we had the silver bullet and we were so excited and that we should start treatment right away. She was equally excited and she said, gosh, this timing is great. I haven't been feeling well. In fact, I'm in the ER right now because I'm kind of sick, so I'm glad that the drug has arrived. She got admitted to the hospital that day and she never left. She passed away before we could give her the silver bullet. That was tough. That was a very difficult professional experience. One third of us in this room will be diagnosed with cancer. So look to your left and look at the guy on the right. And if it's not you, it's going to be one of them. And if it's not you or one of your neighbors, then it'll be a parent or a spouse or, heaven forbid, a child. For some, cure will be an option. For others, cure won't be an option. Some will be diagnosed with colon cancer, some with lung cancer, others with melanoma, pancreas cancer, or lymphoma. For those who are diagnosed, the statistics can be really scary. If you're, if you're found with early stage lung cancer, you have a 52% chance of surviving five years. If you're found to have late stage lung cancer, you have a 4% chance of surviving five years. And if the statistics aren't scary, they're weird. Here's an example. Patients with colon cancer, stage three colon cancer, half of them will be cured and never deal with their disease again. The other half will have their disease come back and kill them within five years. Talk about disparate outcomes. And here's the crazy part. As scientists and physicians, we can't tell the difference. Historically, we haven't been able to tell the difference between those who are going to survive and those who are going to die from their disease. So the result is we've had to treat them all the same. But that's changing. Toma was the, one of the early examples of using DNA to understand cancers to understand how they're different and maybe how they should be treated. But it's complicated. DNA is complicated. And in fact, I, I, it's, uh, it's a challenge. I, I think it's worth a little review, a little DNA 101. Our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, liver cells, lung cells, cancer, uh, uh, colon cells, hopefully not cancer cells, <laughs> all these different cell types. And what they have in common is at the center are all of these long strands of DNA. These DNA or these DNA strands are bundled up into chromosomes. In total, there are 46. We get half from our mom and the other half from our dad. If we were to pull one of those DNA strands out, one of those chromosomes, and stretch it out, we would see the classical double helix uh, structure that we've all heard about in school. We'd also see these organized regions called genes. In total, there are 20,000 genes. And if we were to dive one level deeper, we would see that holding up, holding together that double helix structure are all of these individual base pairs. In total, there are four, typically referred to as A, C, T, and G. These base pairs repeat all along these DNA strands millions and millions of times. In total, there are three billion base pairs. So this complement of three billion base pairs, 20,000 genes, and 46 chromosomes is termed one genome. And there's a copy, an identical copy, of that genome in every single cell of the body. It's astonishing. 
Well, the approach that we took with Toma was to map all 3 billion base pairs in 20,000 genes. And the hope is that we would find a, a magic bullet. And in her case, we did. And it turns out that's not trivial. Trying to map 3 billion base pairs is actually the easy part. The hard part is then analyzing all that data. As an example, and to illustrate this point, on the screen, there are 2,700 base pairs just on this one screen. If you times that by 1.1 million, you get 3 billion base pairs. So to map someone's genome, then all you have to do is sift through 1.1 million slides like this in hopes of finding the small base pair change that caused that cancer to grow. And it can happen on any one of those 1.1 million slides. So it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, or like a micro needle in a haystack, or maybe like an invisible needle in a haystack. It's, it's not easy, but we're getting better at it. So it turns out that the first time a human genome had ever been mapped was in 2003. You may remember hearing about it. There were all these headlines about the Human Genome Project, and it was going to change medicine, and it is. But at the time, that first genome, 3 billion base pairs and 20,000 genes, took four years to map and cost $3 billion. Breathtaking. So we're lucky because today we can accomplish something very similar. And instead of taking years, it takes a few days. And it costs a few thousand dollars instead of a few billion dollars. So we've made extraordinary progress. In addition to this enormous technological progress, we've had all of this pharmaceutical development. So we now have drugs being made. In fact, the current whole new class of drugs being made are targeted at certain DNA changes, certain gene mutations. So we're at a place in history where we've never been. We're at this confluence of scientific understanding. We understand genes better than we ever have in history. We have the technology that has never existed before to map those genes, and we now finally have drugs to start to target those genes, and this confluence is enabling this new paradigm known as precision medicine. And it works, it's totally exciting. We can map a patient's cancer, find a gene, provide them with the right drug, and the outcomes can be astonishing. The caveat is it doesn't work for everyone, and it's not clear why, and it's pretty clear that we shouldn't use it for everyone, and so there's lots still to be sorted out. But there's a bigger challenge, and that challenge is as we use this DNA mapping, we constantly subclassify patients. So you no longer just have a stomach cancer, you, in fact, in Toma's case, have a stomach cancer with these four or five specific genes altered. And now, the, other, the patient next to her, also with stomach cancer, actually has three or four different genes altered. And so quickly, it starts to become the case where no two patients are alike. Every single cancer is actually a different disease, which is good because now we can individualize patients' treatment but it's a problem because it actually violates a basic principle of medicine, which is we treat the patient in front of us right now based on how we've treated past patients. You treat the patient with pneumonia in your office today based on the 100 previous pneumonia patients you've treated. You treat the lung cancer patient based on how all the other 100 lung cancer patients have done that you've seen before. So that's, that's kind of the challenge. <clears throat> so I've been lamenting this and commenting on how what this notion of precision medicine really needs is a huge database of a million or two million tumors that have all been mapped, all three billion base pairs and 20,000 genes. And then we could use those to make predictions about how future patients would respond. So it's a nice idea, it would be great, but it doesn't exist, or so I thought. Then one day I was talking to a colleague and I mentioned this exact problem, and he said, you know, there's something you ought to see. And he walked me into this room, this old, musty, dusty, concrete basement in the, middle of, uh, in the basement of a hospital in the middle of Salt Lake City, and I was shocked to look and see rows and rows and rows of samples, every kind of sample you can imagine, surgical samples, biopsies, tumors, any specimen that had been collected since the 70s across a 22 hospital system in the Intermountain West was stored here to the tune of 5 million samples. 
Okay, so now we're in business. The even better part is it's not just that these are old samples stored in wax blocks, I mean, they are, but the best part is we know the health history that is associated with all of these samples. So I can go in and literally pull off a sample, pull a sample off the shelf from 2007 or 1997 or 1987 or 1977 and know exactly what happened to the patient after that sample was acquired. So think of the power of that. We now have the opportunity to go in, grab a sample, do the DNA mapping, find the genes that are worrisome, and use that exact same map and look for current and future patients who have an identical map. Imagine taking and finding a, a patient, think of it as a fingerprint. A patient has a certain DNA fingerprint today, and we go back and find a patient who had the exact same cancer and exact same DNA fingerprint, and now we know how to treat that patient better. Recall those colon cancer patients that we couldn't tell apart. Imagine taking all of the colon cancer patients out of this repository, this biorepository, and mapping those and saying, okay, these with this set of DNA, this set of genes and DNA fingerprints survived, and these ones over here didn't, I can use that information now for the current and future patients I'll see so that we don't have to treat them all the same. We can start to treat them in an individualized way. And the applications get better. Imagine if we were to draw a drop of blood from people in the audience today, and suppose we were to look for those worrisome DNA signatures we found from past patients, and if we found them in someone's blood today, it would tell us they've got an early cancer. Now we're talking about preventing cancer. That, that kind of test could be run in every primary care clinic in the world. The cure for cancer isn't a fancy new pill. The cure for cancer is prevention. And this kind of blood-based liquid biopsy screening test could help us find those cancers before they become a problem. So what are we doing about it? Well, my team and I have built this huge DNA sequencing center. And we're starting to pull those samples out of the basement. We're dusting them off, scaring away the mice, extracting the DNA, and we're mapping it. And we're finding fingerprints some of the first of these projects are, are starting just now. We anticipate having an enormous cohort of breast cancer samples. And as I've been thinking about this and these projects that are, that are just starting and the excitement around them, I can't help but think about Toma and this experience I had in the middle of her treatment. She called me one day excitedly. She said, you won't believe what happened to me last night. Now, of course, I was curious. She said, I was at a restaurant. My curiosity started to dip a little. She said, I opened a fortune cookie, and my fortune said, you will, make, you will make a name for yourself in medical science. What kind of precision <laughs> fortune is that? I always get these fortunes that say things like, your prospects for making friends are looking up, you know. She's going to make a name for herself in medical science. So she and I both, of course, thought that meant she was going to have this miraculous response to the silver bullet, that she would be cured and go on to be famous for this tremendous outcome. Imagine my expectations. Of course, that didn't happen. That was, that was devastating at the time. I now realize, though, that Toma has made a name for herself by guiding us through this entire journey. And there are, the, the, the magic of that biorepository with those five million samples is that there are literally millions of experiences just like Thomas waiting to teach us. The answer to how we treat patients in the future is locked away in those samples from the past. I could not be more excited and more optimistic about the future. If you need me or would like to talk to me, come find me. I'll be busy diving into the past. Thank you.